Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Claire Walker, and I am co-chief executive of the Society of London Theatre and UK Theatre, which is an organisation that has members up and down the country and also in the West End, uh, representing their views to Westminster and also working on them with all sorts of other issues, including um, employment rights, um, law and workforce, which is why I'm really, really excited to be here. Now, be nice to me because I'm only on week seven um, of the new role, and this is the first time that I've done a panel discussion uh, in this sector. So I am very, very much looking forward to it, and I have a fabulous panel uh, to help me. So first of all, we have Angela Akati-Michaels, who is a freelance director, and she's going to tell us a little bit about herself in a minute. Then we have Amina Hamid, who's a freelance producer. She's got a fantastic story about how she uh, saved uh, from disaster during lockdown um, and, and has got a very successful career. And we've got Paulie Constable, who is a freelance uh, lighting director. So Angela, first of all, can I just ask you to give a summary of your experience and how you ended up on a discussion panel about freelancers? My goodness. Well, um I would say that I ended up here through uh, relationships, so somebody recommended me, and I would say one, that's one of the most important things about being freelance is relationships with the people that you meet and you work with. Um, my journey is not a typical journey. I started out many, many years ago through um, dance and then moving into acting, and then my interests took me into theatre directing, and so that's kind of what I've been, been doing for the past... I won't say how many years. Um, the kind of work I do, I like to say that I want to do work that makes people feel alive, come alive, and connect with the stories. So my work's very much character-based. I think that it's quite visceral. I use a lot of movement, and I like playing with different elements as well within my work. So um, I don't know what to say about the most, maybe the most exciting, the most challenging uh, piece that I've done was a huge uh, promenade piece in Barking that was part of Studio Three Arts, and it was a revised version of Merchant of Venice, um, including sort of key uh, professional actors and then loads of people from the community to, to make up. And this thing went through town. It was absolutely uh, divine, and we had, we had good weather. Down to some intimate pieces, um, just directed a one-woman show that we took up to the Liverpool Theatre Festival, um, which was a story about a small community uh, within Liverpool of these mixed-race women back in the day um, who had lived their lives basically in Toxteth in this one community and how they look out on the world and also the networks they have. So it's varied from... Um, you know, intimate pieces, which I love because I love getting into the psychology of human beings and how do we translate that to meet an audience? So the audience meets halfway and it's... I kind of think that theatre, in a way, should be a bit like poetry, where the, the intangibles, um, the things that connect to your core, to your soul, are the things that you walk out with. So it's not all done and dusted and happy ever after, um, but somewhere in there, there's things that set off questions um, to help change and move us along. I think in rehearsals, everybody should be changed by the process. And similarly, I'd love to think that the audience is also changed by what they see. So that's me. You can have lots more questions at the end if you want. <laughs> Great, amazing. Thank you, Angela. Amina, how did you, how, how did you end up here? Um, yeah, so I... Gosh, how did I end up here? Um, I've been producing since I was 17, which is five years ago, because I'm 22. I know I look so much younger. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a producer, so I'm a freelance producer. I used to work in-house at Soho Theatre as their theatre producer as well. Um, and I, yeah, I chose to be freelance, actually, which, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and... I've done a lot. I've done everything from Edinburgh Fringe all the way up to commercial West End um, in 2020. I did my first West End show, which was a drag murder mystery called Death Drop, you might have heard of. Um, and I became the youngest producer ever, joint youngest producer ever on the West End, youngest woman by 10 years, which is kind of horrible. Um, <laughs> and 
start, so that was the start of my West End career. And since then, I've done, I've worked on magic shows, I've worked on musicals. Um, the highlight, though, is probably working on The Wiz, which I did at the Hope Mill Theatre in Manchester, um, and for which I just won a Best Producer Award, which is mm. really, thank you. Mm. Amazing. <laughs> um, and is also in the exhibit at the VNA, which is their Reimagining Musicals exhibit, which if you get the chance to go, is amazing and so much fun. Um, but yeah, how did I end up here? Um, so I did a program called Bridge the Gap with a, a charity called Stage One that supports emerging and theater producers and specifically commercial producers. And um, that's how I met Siobhan, who puts together the whole day and is amazing, um, just to say. Um, and, and yeah, and I think, so Siobhan's kind of been looking after me since I started and, and now I'm here and apparently slightly more established according to everybody else, but we will, we'll see. I'm still, I'm still faking it, I think. <laughs> Doing a great job. Paulie. Um, so I, I've, I'm a lighting designer I've been doing this for quite a long time, I realize. Um, my journey into this industry is I started working in rock and roll, so I didn't know anything about theater or opera or anything. And um, the idea that I'd ever be sitting on the, one of the stages of the Royal Opera House talking about my job is absolutely ridiculous to me. I've ended up being quite legit. It was never the, that's not <laughs> what I set out to be. Um, but yes, my job, uh, I am freelance by necessity. So uh, I'm a gun for hire. I work all over the world. Um, and generally my work is based on relationships. So it's based on the creative teams that I work with, my friends and colleagues that I've gone on this journey with, um, who like me never set out to be doing the sort of work they're doing now. So people like Marianne Elliott um, and Ray Smith and Vicky Mortimer, designers and directors rufus who runs the national we all met doing sort of terrible fringe shows together um back in the day and have just gone on this journey together uh i suppose if my work has any sort of muscle around it i've worked in kind of collective highly collaborative sort of really um not necessarily text-based work all the time uh i think so a couple of shows that I've designed that you may have heard of, I designed a production of a show called War Horse that was in the West End for quite a long time. And I also designed a show called Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. So both the shows where lighting is very participatory, it's a big part of the storytelling. Uh, I'm not good at being in rooms where I'm being told what to do. I'm, being, I'm better at being in rooms where we're sharing conversation and developing language together. And that's what I really enjoy. So that's me. Well, we are absolutely super privileged to have you all here and amazing to hear your story. And the first theme that I'm pulling out today is that there doesn't seem to be any direct path that, that freelancers follow. So I think that's really interesting. So first of all, why are freelancers, and we, we've touched on this a little bit poorly, but why are freelancers so key to theatre? Um, I think they're really key to organisations because when organisations are looking for somebody with a particular skill set, um, then they can go and get them. They don't have to bear the expense, really, of having that person on salary all the time. They can pull in expertise. I think that freelancers are actually sort of carriers of ideas and things between different companies because we tend to work from one to the other to the other. We meet people, we collaborate, and ideas grow. And some of those things then we take on to our next place. So I think we really do enrich organizations um, and allow them to have a little bit of, of flexibility in what they do um, because we are so flexible. Um, I think we play a key role in keeping them in touch as well with, with the industry and what's happening there, particularly if you're working in an organization that's a small team that's always busy, that hasn't got time to go out and about and see what's always happening. I think that, that freelancers really um, bring in that freshness and also um, a positivity and a real sort of can-do attitude because you often do have to can-do um, and think on your feet. And I think that we make things work. Um, we're always positive, I think, in the right circumstances. And, yeah, we bring a vitality to, to organisations, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Amina. Yeah, I think also it does come down to expertise. A lot of 
the, the great thing about freelancers is that we're able to work on many different things and many different projects. And so when it comes to another project and, you, and you're, let's say that you're looking for a lighting designer for a musical, you know that these lighting designers are really good at, at musicals. And so you're able to find that specific person rather than having necessarily an, somebody in-house that you work with all the time. Um, you're able to have that diversity of voices in rooms and, and across productions. As, as a venue, as a producer, as a, as a company, whatever it is, um, I also, it's really funny being freelance because I also hire a lot of freelancers, so I see it from both sides. Um, but be, yeah, being able to find those people and, and work with somebody who's really right for one show and wouldn't be at all right for another show is, is really exciting and it makes it a lot more I think, interesting for, for audiences as much as for people you're working with. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we often think about casting around actors and performers. And actually, I think when you're putting together a show, you're casting everybody. You're casting your stage management team, you're casting your lighting designers, you're casting your voice person, you're, you know, and not everybody is right for every project, you know, and part of your journey through this industry is about finding your voice and finding what what interests you and what stories you want to participate in telling and uh, in in a way you can slightly you can have the flexibility I would imagine that's one of the reasons why you shifted from being employed to being freelance is that you're more able to discover your own voice rather than speaking in the voice of a building or being sort of slightly bound by that so it's quite liberating. I mean, the other thing about our world, this performing arts world, is 70% of us are freelance. So mm -hmm. it is just worth noticing that you're not alone. Um, but it's also really worth keeping that conversation alive because it's quite easy to feel alone in that. But actually, the more we share our experiences and encourage each other to have a voice and to speak out, the better. Because um, we can be positive, but also it creates a vulnerability if we're honest as well. Yes. Um, yeah. I think, that's so true. I think we're going to talk a bit more about the vulnerability mm. um, in a minute and actually hear how, how, I, how it has been quite tough for freelancers in the, in the, in the, last, in the last two years. Um, mm. What's the best thing about being... We heard a little bit about that, but is there anything in addition to that that's really, really good about being a freelancer? So the opportunity to move around. I, Paulie, I, it sounds like you literally travel the world, and I wonder whether you guys too, do too, but you literally can go anywhere that's that, that's a huge uh, huge hugely exciting although i'm sure it has its headaches at times but other other things that are, are, are really attractive about being a freelancer yeah um i love it because i'm i'm i also don't like being told what to do um and as a producer that if you're working for a venue or a building a lot of the time you spend your time being kind of told what to do not really but um and you have to, you're, yes, you are very beholden to what the venue wants and what the venue needs. And um, working somewhere like Soho is really interesting because they do a full comedy program as much as their theatre program. And so a lot of what you're doing is your set is sometimes being stood on at 9 p.m. by a comedian after your show. And what does that mean? And, and so it's really nice to have the freedom to choose what I work on, particularly because I now do a lot more large musicals that's that's always been my my thing and so it's nice to have a space where you can do that um and, and I, I really enjoy bouncing around i really enjoy working with different teams and so being able to go from one theater to the next to the next is is really nice i i love that freedom and i just spent three weeks in the u.s as well so i i really enjoy that um the ability to 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 travel in like in the sense of actually traveling, but also to travel across different sort of areas of London, even with with venues or areas of the country or whatever else, um, that I really enjoy the sort of freedom of it all. Yeah, I also it's a sense of freedom. I was um, four years. I did take a, a associate directorship job at the Half Moon. Um, young People's Theatre, and I was there for four years. A very exciting time when we were working with Cross Art Form. But in the end, I went back into the freelance life because it does offer you so many opportunities and a richness in terms of the people uh, that you meet and also opportunities, say, as a director to work with uh, new writing, which I absolutely love. And uh, 
Paul, you mentioned sort of finding your voice, and that's something that I think is, is, is a lifelong process that you never finish because you think you've arrived somewhere, and then another piece of work or opportunity opens up something else to you. Um, so I think that if you're curious, um, although it can be very precarious, and we talked about vulnerability, that it's very exciting to be freelance because there's the anticipation and you never know quite how something's going to sort of like come into its own and what then comes on from that. So if you can deal with uncertainty, um, it's a very exciting way of life. I haven't travelled widely with, with, not in my incarnation as a director, the farthest to have been is to take a show out to Basel, but um, it's, just, it's just great working with different people, different teams, um, and yes, collaboration. Yeah. See, we did, but all of you sort of touched on this, but I think, you know, freelancers have had a really tough time in the pandemic for the obvious reasons that they weren't employed and, and, and then had less access mm. uh, to, to, um, to support. Perhaps you could sort of, without wanting to get us too depressed, you know, perhaps give us a flavour of, of what that was like and, and, mm. and, and sort of and what have we learned from that process mm. and, and, and what is there still to do, I think, probably. Uh, Paulie, should we go with you first? Um, I think it wasn't only the lack of support. I think the thing that was really uh, almost more frightening, disempowering for people was the lack of information. Mm -hmm. Because we're not seen as one thing and we're not supported as one thing, that, you know, buildings and companies were, were, were talking to the, each, themselves within themselves. Nobody was talking to us. And when you're a large part of the industry, that was really... Nobody had any, any idea what was going on. So the pandemic was really... It's like we were held in this vacuum. And, you know, I, as, as Claire knows, I got involved with trying to break that down and advocate for the freelance community. But it, it, it made you realise that that sense that you have when you're a freelancer of quite often feeling that you are on your own was actually articulated by the structures of our industry. So that is something that we do need to work on and make better. Um, so, but, so it, yes, there was the, f the fiscal side of it being problematic, but there was also the kind of lack of involvement in this industry that would, well, some of us had given a life to, some of us had just entered, but all of us feeling like, I don't know where I am in this picture, which was, was really tough. That, that's so interesting. So, so people were thinking about, say, for example, the Royal Opera House, where we are today, they were thinking about, their employees and their their staff and their, they maybe they're even thinking about you know in in, in all the right ways so their supporters and then communicating yeah. what they're doing but then uh, let's not blame them because we're, we're no, here no, but, no. but as an example that that, that that they just didn't think uh, uh, any the the sector didn't think how do i communicate to these people that i rely on yeah but but actually uh they're so busy, they're, they're trying to work out their own things they, they forgot about this really important group that's incredibly powerful and a real lesson um, you had a slightly different experience, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I, I will also say that as we headed into March of 2020, I was thinking about taking a break because I'd been working quite intensely. Um, so it was, a good, it was good timing. Um, but I did have to close some shows and, and say goodbye to a lot of teams. And, and luckily, we were, you know, we were in a position to pay them, but it was really difficult. And then I sort of landed with not enough information about what I'd been doing to actually get any kind of support. So I had to pivot um, and figure out what to do. And I ended up working in audio plays and podcasts. Um, I know a lot of people started a podcast in the pandemic. It was not like that. <laughs> it was not me talking about myself. Um, but we, we created, with Arts Council funding, actually a uh, Halloween podcast called Tales from the Tombstone Tavern which was, and the reason for doing that as well, particularly, was it was this group of, it's a group of well-known monsters, everyone from Frankenstein's monsters to, to Dracula. Um, and they're all sat in a pub chatting about who's the scariest, basically, and they all <laughs> tell you their own ghost story. Um, and the thing for us was being able to, to work on that, but I also worked on that with people across the world. So we had recording sessions at seven in the morning, um, so that we could get our actor from LA involved. Uh, we had a writer and director from Melbourne um, and then people from dotted around the UK as well. And being able to 
record a podcast <laughs> across different parts of the UK was amazing um, and, and meant that I could actually live because I could fund part of that. And then I did a couple of other things. And so figuring out how online worked was a big part of making sure that as a freelancer, I still had the, the possibility of having a viable career in spite of the fact that everything was closed. Um, and equally being able to do that without just sort of sitting there and ho sitting on my hands and hoping um, because I didn't have the any kind of support to be able to do that, which I I realize is, is both a negative and a positive, but it did give me the opportunity to find a different area that is now actually very key to what I do as a producer in terms of digital work um, alongside everything else. That's really fascinating. Um, really fascinating. We're coming up to Halloween. What about a bit of a relaunch? Is it still I out I mean, it's, it's still around. It's two years old. I got a notification. It's still on Spotify if you want to listen to it. Six episodes. Sounds good. I think, um, I think I'll go and do that later. Okay. <laughs> and... Thank you. Um, yeah, it was kind of a shock when everything's sort of taken away from you and everything's shut down, as you say, quite isolating. Um, the time I've been in, there were lots of chats with other um, people in the industry as well. And one of the things that came up was the Arts Council were offering um, grants um, for people for projects that they wanted to pursue. Um, and I did have a, sort of a passion project that's still in development and was able to kind of kick off. Um, I did get an award and was able to sort of start that. So that kept me um, going for a bit. And I must say I was really grateful to that because I have no idea what I would have done without that because there's nothing worse than not knowing what's coming and not being able to be engaged in something that's been your life and your craft. Um, another bit of diversification was, because I'd been directing at Identity um, Drama School, was that they suddenly opened up online. And so suddenly there was all these Zoom offers. Um, so I took um, a couple of classes, which then became international classes, which was, you know, I was talking to people in Singapore, in Madrid, in Los Angeles, and la la la, and it was, um, a joy actually to work with these guys and just keep creativity going on, on uh, working through text online uh, with people with such a diverse backgrounds coming together in this kind of global classroom. Um, but yeah, it was very sticky, very difficult. Don't want to make out that uh, lockdown was easy. And certainly, um, you know, I was able to claim the um, Rishi Sunak's kind of furlough y thing for for self-employed, because I have been in the industry, but 80% um, of a low income is, don't want to be horrible, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually cover, cover everything, so, but it's better than nothing, so, but uh, testing times. Yeah, really, really great to hear. So what have we learned from this process, and, 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 and how are freelancers getting a, a, a voice, and, 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 and how are they trying to move forward to change with Prime Minister Sunak. So Paul, <laughs> Paulie has been spearheading some of this work. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about, about what you'd like to see changed and, 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 and how you're going about that. And then others can... I mean, the, the, the list is, is very, very long. I do think one of the things that everything that uh, all of us have been talking about is ingenuity and about complexity. And one of the things that was very apparent is that there are very few freelancers who do one thing. You know, we're all doing lots of things to survive. And I've worked for years as an electrician as well as a lighting designer or whatever. So I think I would just encourage you to have that kind of approach to your future, to kind of be open to possibility. Um, structurally, we need to be more visible to, to government. And we're not good at that. In a way, we have that very flexibility that we have, that kind of fleet thing where we move from project to project also makes us vulnerable. And, you know, you might be that you're doing some teaching and that's PAYE and then you're doing some work of your own and that's Schedule D. And it's just, we're just a mess. And um, we need to st sort of slightly professionalise and take responsibility for our position. We also need to, um, when you leave a job or leave a building and move on, quite often we can leave those things behind. And I think we need to take a more participatory uh, attitude towards how we work with people and to give feedback and to open up conversations and to 
take responsibility for behaviours in the rooms that we're in. Um, so it's a two-way street, the, the kind of development of the freelancer. How do you recognise 200,000 people who are sort of essentially invisible? Um, we just need to make a little bit more noise. I have essentially been quite disappointed by the unions, I'll say it, but I have also made myself rejoin the union because any union is only as strong as its, as its workforce and its membership. And if we're worried about our working conditions, we need to engage with that, with mechanisms that pre-exist. Um, but I think also just talking to each other more, I think we're all quite um, secretive, quite sort of, we're all surviving. And in some ways we're very bad at being honest about what survival feels like. And I think sharing that more is really healthy. I think that's really, really useful. Angela, and then I'm gonna to come to Amina. Same question. Yeah. So right. <laughs> um, in an ideal... Well, what, changes, well, let's what, just, changes. What, what changes you'd like to see? Um, I'd like to see organisations kind of, in a sense, embrace their freelancers a bit more so we don't just come in and slide out, you know. Um, and, and in a way, this would be, be like having a, a, some sort of overall connectedness between organisations that's a, a sort of manifesto, I don't know, it sounds a bit grand, for freelancers because we do uh, work in a very sort of vulnerable way. I'm concerned about rates of pay, which um, freelancers has uh, sort of like, whether you're on like a total contract for one thing or you're going in to do just a little bit of work. Um, you know, it's very hard to set your rates when you're with a company that's arguing that it hasn't got X, Y, Z funding, and you think, well, you knew you were going to do this project, so why did you estimate that a freelancer's uh, rate was, was, you know, their fee is going to be quite, quite so low? So I think that's one of the, the difficulties, is that every year, salaried people would have some incremental um, increase, and, and freelancers not necessarily. So I think there needs to be quite a big discussion over that. And also um, looking after freelancers if things are, are cancelled and realising, you know, so your project's gone down the drain, but actually, you know, you're taking these other people kind of with you, not necessarily always getting paid. And this is where um, a union is really, really useful because before um, lockdown, I had a, a, a project that, that, that fell through and they were just going to walk away, sorry, but actually equity got onto them and so I did get my fee. So I think it's that discussion and I think if we could have a meeting point for, for so there are little networks and little groups, but something that's maybe a little bit more cohesive and uh, whether that would be under the auspices of equity or other unions where freelancers can really dialogue honestly and truthfully about uh, what it is that are the obstacles that are in their way to, to kind of doing their best work. Um, I think that sometimes as well, if you've got additional skills, organisations will make use of that and maybe not everything's been set up properly, say, I don't know, if I was doing a scene that, 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 that uh, needed, I thought needed an intimacy director, they might know I've done uh, that type of work before and think, well, could you manage that? Could you do this? And so I think for freelancers to actually be able to kind of say no, stand up for things and have a dialogue with other freelancers would be amazing in some sort of more formal structure. Yeah, yeah. maybe there is and I just haven't <laughs> keyed into it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and then we're going to th throw it out to the floor. So start thinking about what your questions would be. Um, I think honesty is absolutely mm. something, but I also think that care is a big part of what I look to do. And, and in being a producer, it does mean that I have a little bit of ability to put those things in place. Um, I often think about the fact that we don't have HR departments or any kind of care <laughs> system um, for our freelancers that we work with. And so... Um, I'm, 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 I'm verging on a secret. That's where I'm, I'm sat next to a secret. I have like, I mean, I may as well say it, but I'm setting up a new company that specifically focuses on HR and in care in, um, in our sector, particularly. TV and film has it. So that mm -hmm. essentially every set you walk onto, you also know that there is an HR department behind that. And it is not an HR department that belongs to that production company. So you don't have to hire, you know, a whole, HR team, but instead 
is a freelance, essentially a freelance roving HR department, which is something that I think is really important for our productions so that there is a, a place for that care to exist. Um, a lot of people want it to happen, but it's also the last thing on anyone's mind when you're trying to put a show together is to try and build a space for, for care and, and, um, and so that, that's a big part of what I want freelancers to have is a little bit more support from that side so there's somewhere for them to go. I mean, breaking, mm. we've had an announcement, haven't we? Well, we've, well, <laughs> well, we've been up. here. And, um, you know, it sounds like a, a fantastic opportunity. Mm. I think it'll be very well uh, needed. Right, uh, throwing it open, we've got, please do say your, your name um, and hands up. Uh, let's get some questions for this fabulous panel. Let's go here first. Lauren, who's watching online, says that nobody likes networking. It can be awkward, but it's an important skill for freelancers. What advice would you give to Lauren? Oh, mm -hmm. I, I love this question because you've actually answered the question. Um, nobody likes networking. I don't like networking. But if you see me at a networking event, it looks like I like networking because I'm talking to people. Everybody at networking events tends to just talk to the people they know. So sometimes you're sort of there going, I don't feel like I can, all of these people already know each other. But the reason they're not talking to other people isn't because they don't want to, it's because everybody hates networking. <laughs> Um, and often it's about sort of finding a little bit of courage to break into a group or mm -hmm. to, to do that kind of thing. The first thing I would say, and this is always my, my tip, is that the first time you meet someone is not necessarily the last time you meet someone. You don't have to say everything ever in that moment. And I think sometimes it feels like you have to go, I've done all these things and I promise I'm good at what I do and I'd, li I'd really like to have a coffee with you and please can we meet again and then, then you'll maybe never see them again. But at least they know those things. Often I tend to talk to people about their shoes, their animals, <laughs> their like the, whatever room we're in. At one point I had a networking event that was basically in a greenhouse on a very hot day and it was the best conversation starter <laughs> because you could go, and they've put us in a greenhouse, isn't that terrible? And then you'd talk about someone's dog or so, something else. And so treating people like people is the best way to network because if you go up to someone and start spilling out why you really love theater or you really care about um, their work or whatever else, that's, that's lovely, but really what people remember is that person that they spoke to about their shoes. <laughs> I don't know why, but that is, that's, that's my best piece of advice for now. Amazing mm -hmm. advice, amazing mm -hmm. advice. Uh, either of you two? Anything to add? Well, I'd just add to, to what you were saying um, about just being yourself and totally natural. You can't always be in the mood to network, but you can always be in the mood to kind of be interested in people and meet people. And what they want to know is who you are. And it's about forming those relationships and not like jumping on somebody because you, you immediately want to work with them. So I think, yeah, just, just being real, just being real. Yeah. I have to do lots of uh, networking in, in, in my job and, ha and have done in all of my jobs. So even though I'm not a freelancer, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a bit of advice, which is phone a friend. <laughs> so one of the things that I think is really important that is people love to be asked for a favour because it makes them feel special. And the number of times that I have asked someone to introduce me to someone, either virtually or in person, um, because they're someone that I might need um, some help for in the future or they might offer some advice. And they are very willing to do that and they, they introduce you to that person, and then you have to return the favor. So, you know, if there is someone that I know in my network, I'm very happy to introduce you to them. Um, and, uh, but I will always go back, whether it's on a really, really small thing, or it's something for my, for my kids, or something for something, I will always go back, and I will always pass on the favor to make sure that you, you, you pass it on and you, you repay the favor. And it's a, people really do not mind. So uh, it's a good tip to have. Excellent question. Do you, do you like that one? We've got some more questions over here. So I have a question for Amina. Um, because you mentioned you produced on the West End, and I was wondering whether you ever worked uh, with private investors, and if so, how did you build those relationships? Oh, this is my favorite question. Um, <laughs> I, so I don't come from money. That's the first point. I know I sound like I do. I'm just from the South. Um, <laughs> but, um, and the big thing was 
being really creative with how I found people. Um, so that is sometimes finding people from my hometown, um, finding people who, are, who do what I do but are further ahead in their career. Um, a lot of the best investors are also producers. Um, and, and, ju and just building, I mean, it's slow and it's not easy, but once you start doing it, people start finding you. Um, I once met an investor, he's my, she's my favorite, who I'm, <laughs> that's probably bad to say, but she is my favorite, um, who I met at a comedy show. And so what I say about talking to people as people, uh, we, did, we, just, we talked about her husband and we talked about so many other things. Um, and then she sent me a follow-up email that said, I'd really love to talk to you about investment. Um, and I just didn't expect it at all. So it is, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy, but it's about, you, you, get, you start to get the hang of it, of finding those people and sort of truffle sniffing. I'm thinking about pigs. Truffle <laughs> sniffing for the, pe for the right people. Um, it's, the other thing to do as well is I, I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, much though I don't like it, and it makes it look like I've, I've never done an actual job because it's project by project. Um, and I find people that way, and just finding people who are interested in theater and might have some money and, and whatever that might be, and also building those relationships. Um, there are sometimes people that I talk to, bec not because I know they have money, I'm making myself sound very shallow, but you start talking to someone and you kind of realize. So I would take an interest in everyone because they could potentially invest in a show or lead you to an investor or whatever else. Because it's it genuinely, if you the number of people I've spoken to which have then ended up being really great friends or being really great investors or being really great business partners that you just never would have thought that would have happened, it is slow. I've sent so many emails with no response, with no's, with I don't actually have money, I don't know why you think I have money, um, all of those things. But there are people out there who want to support projects and also putting you at the center of it. I used to lead with, I have this great project. They don't care. Um, you, you lead with, I'm a great investment, please. Um, and, then, and then tell them about the project. And so you get to really develop relationships where they invest, hopefully over and over again, or maybe once, but you know exactly what things they're interested in. So hopefully that's helpful. That's a very roundabout answer. Um, but yeah, it's not easy. Angela, Pauli, <laughs> do either of you have thoughts on this? Um, well, back in the day, um, I set up a company called Tell Tara with a friend, which is, we're just meeting to talk again. And we had to meet people and also um, ask for money. And we got it from unusual places. And, you know, for instance, one, one of uh, our things was funded by Guinness. So they gave a uh, free Guinness punch to everybody that, that, that came to the show and free Guinness in, 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 in the interval. So that's amazing. Um, we also had people like travel agents donate. It's amazing what, this is on a much smaller scale, obviously, but it's amazing that when you ask what people will give um, and they do like to help, and I think it's just the process of, of not being scared to ask and tell them exactly what it's for and what your, what your purpose is, why you're doing this, what sort of audiences you're trying to reach. And then when they understand the work, understand you, um, found that generally if they can, they will. So I would say don't, don't be scared about asking and don't be scared about rejection either because if people can't, they can't and it's never personal. It's, yeah. yeah. There's something about commodification and surprise, isn't there? There's something about that question about networking and the question about investors. And actually, you know, in the conversation about freelancers generally, I think what the pandemic exposed was a lack of mutual understanding about our situation. And in a way, everything we're talking about is the same. We're saying when you talk to people, talk to people in that element of wanting to discover and wanting to be surprised. We are all storytellers. And it's, uh, you know, one of the things that had happened pre-pandemic is that we'd stopped understanding each other's stories, be that as mm -hmm. freelancers or as employers or as investors or whatever. So in a way, what you're talking about, which is so brilliant, is just be open to the possibility without objectifying or commodifying each other into terms of what you do. It's much more interesting to discover who we are. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's the most important thing, isn't it? And then those journey, we can go on those journeys as we learn more. Brilliant. Mm. 
I'm feeling inspired already. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I also can't say, I don't know if this mic's right up the top, but, uh, but if you do want to ask a question, do put your hand up. We've got a question here. It's, it's not actually very easy. Oh, and one up there as well. So we'll, we'll go here and then there. It's not very easy to be able to see you, actually. So. Thank you. Um, this was really great, super informative, incredible discussion. So thank you all so much. And I had a question for Angela. Um, as a freelance director, uh, I was just wondering, because you spoke at the beginning about having uh, done and directed very intimate pieces and very large, larger scale productions, mm -hmm. um, how in your creative process do you land on projects, choose the material, does it start, how does that change every time for you? How do you end up working on, on specific projects? Um, and whether, yes, if it changes all the time or whether it's a consolidation of your voice that you also all touched on um, throughout the years, and if that has changed as well. Um, yes. Great. Yes, it's, 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 it's a fabulous question. I would say that um, because I came into this area of work myself quite late, I'm still developing that voice. Um, I was very, very interested at one time in, in, in working with theatre for people of, say, 14 to, to 21, and then it evolved, it evolved from that. In terms of choosing the pieces, it's what's presented to me either as an idea, like a writer that wanted to write up about Ira Aldridge, and this was the one we took to Basel, and it's, yes, it's, again, if there's something in it where I feel that someone's taken a step of courage uh, and sort of through their vulnerability, they've moved on, then I feel it's a question that addresses all of us and that would pull any audience in. Um, it has varied because with Tell Tara, what we were really looking at was looking at voices that are traditionally being excluded or marginalized from mainstream theater. So the work and the writers we worked with and the audiences we presented to were very different from, say, an audience that, that you'd get here. And we actively um, went out and flyered in clubs and places like that to get people who'd never been to the theatre to come in before. And that was a very exciting time. In terms of choices, it's the story. It's always the story. It boils down to. So, you know, then we get this playground to, to, to work on and bring out the truth of the, the, the characters that are involved. And hopefully that resonates with the audience. But I have always hated being boxed in. <laughs> um, and it's a question that I often ask myself, say, what is your practice? What are you doing? What is it? And I think that I have developed a way of working that is particularly my practice. And that may end up being the strongest thing. Um, because whenever actors have left the process, they have always commented on the fact that rehearsals have been fantastic. So I'm, I think possibly I'm finding my voice through that process. And then my passion projects are the ones that I think ultimately will uh, reveal who I am because they are linked, linked uh, personally. Does that kind of answer your question in a roundabout way? Thank you. Thank you. So we're going up to this person there. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Elle. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, um, this is kind of a generic for, uh, well, for all three of you, but I'm sure there's, it might specify for the, your specific spheres, but if you have any like thoughts or memories or advice of balancing starting freelancing whilst also earning money, part-time arts admin or things like that, yeah, if there's balancing the money earning side and a freelance and how, and the timeline and time frames of knowing that you can lean on freelancing as a crutch rather than, uh, yeah. I didn't quite hear the last bit of your, your question, please. Sorry. Um, just balancing, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, balancing freelancing and whether there's, uh, and not being so overwhelmed and understanding the time, like if there's a timeline mm. in order to know that you can just rely on your freelancing and stuff like that. Okay, so, so mm. when, when, can you, when, when do you feel comfortable to make the jump from paid regular work to uh, 
to going it going uh, it on your own? Uh, yes. I, I've never been anything but freelance, and I think that makes it much easier. That I've, I've, my permanent state of existence is precarious, so I've never known otherwise. But I, so I, I would say the time is never particularly right, but it's also about the environment you're working in and whether that's that's the right environment for you. Um, I think, which is very much your experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I was freelance for a lot of what I've been doing. I also, I will say, I do have a bit of an unconventional uh, start because I did do a three-year degree in social anthropology while producing. It's a bit weird. <laughs> um, but actually, it was very helpful because I could never take anything full-time. Mm. And so even when I worked for Soho, I worked two and a half days a week there was a very interesting argument in how we landed on two and a half days, but, um, and the great thing about that was I got, I had regular income, but I also was developing a lot of work and, and new work and what that might mean. I think, I don't know that there's particularly a time that you realize that being freelance is necessarily viable, but more there's a time where you just have to take the jump is mm -hmm. what I, what I felt. Um, I, I will say though, I still work freelance, but for venues and freelance for other people. So there's not, it's quite an interesting, I think it's quite an interesting phrase, particularly as a producer, because I am a freelance producer. I don't work for anyone else as in terms of full-time or part-time or on PAYE, but I do sometimes sit in, in those places anyway. Um, and bec knowing that and knowing there's always those opportunities means that I have a little bit more stability. Um, but I, I think there's a point where you sort of have to decide. Like, it, as a producer, it's very different if you're, if you're in a role that's much more freelance, but there's a point where you have to decide what it is that you want to do, and, and I didn't want to work for anyone else because I'm stubborn. Um, and so in doing that, I had to figure out a way of making freelance work viable. So what does that mean? Well, actually it means balancing what I, a lot of what I do in exactly that way in terms of these are the things that I find really interesting to do. And these are the things that sometimes, because I, I sometimes do things just for the sake of, of getting paid as much as everybody else does. Um, and I don't think that ever necessarily completely stops, but you do get the freedom to balance the things that you do want to do and the things that maybe are more for the sake of getting a little bit of money in. Um, but I, it was always about making sure that no more than two and a half days in my week were ever taken by anything else um, so that I was always at least a little bit freelance um, and always had a little bit of that freedom. Um, I do think that there is hopefully a point where I, I just, I never have to work for other people ever, which is great. Um, but I don't know what time period that's on. A lot of producers say that they don't make money as a producer until like they, their 30s, but that's an arbitrary age and I make money as a producer and that's, that's the only way I make money now, um, which is really actually quite a big thing to say. Um, but it took, it, it takes a lot of work, but if you're good at producing it and, and actually if you're good at anything really there is a point where people just start hiring you more regularly so even when you do feel like oh gosh next year is a, a blank slate you know that there's a point where somebody something will come in and it's about figuring out exactly how you balance that time and the big thing which we were talking about a little bit earlier is figuring out how to balance that time and also give yourself enough time off and holidays and all of the other things um, so I don't know that there's a definite answer to your question, but there is definitely a point where you realize it's the right thing to do. It's just a little bit more holistic, I would say. Angela, yeah. we've yeah. got time for one more question. So, so uh, raise your hands after Angela's spoken. Cool. Um, it's, it's not easy to know about making the jump, and maybe you make the jump, and then you find yeah. that things didn't necessarily um, turn out as you wish, so you have to be inventive and you have to go back to doing something else to supplement that. Um, there's, it, it requires courage, 
um, but it also requires good sense and a good network around you. And I don't think there's any shame in doing one thing and doing another to bring the money in, you know, but always remembering what's your main thrust and that you are a creative, to feed yourself creatively and develop your ideas. I don't know which area you're, you're wanting to go into, but there will come a time where the networks and the relationships that you've invested in in the past will suddenly be coming back to you. So suddenly somebody that you met 15 years ago is saying, oh, la, 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 I'd really like to work with you on this. Um, sometimes you've got too many projects that you want because they all require, um, you need a producer, <laughs> money to raise. Take an informed leap. If you don't leap, you never know, but it has to be informed, and you have to have, um, in a sense, a, a, enough awareness to know, I, I can do this, yes? So it's as much about what you tell yourself as what's going on out in the world. Thank you. Great. OK, one last question. So uh, hands up. If, oh, mm, I'm just going to go here, just because we I haven't had this part of the room. No. <laughs> it's great to have all these questions. It's as well. Brilliant, yep. I am from a kind of finance and trade management background, and I'm looking to move into theatre because, as you said, it's, it's what would feed me creatively. I feel alive when I'm in the theatre. Um, but I love art, um, I love songwriting, I love story writing, and I really love costume design and making. Um, so I'm kind of a bit overwhelmed as to where to start. I ultimately want to do it all. Do you have any advice as to how to maybe narrow things down? Ooh, um, how to narrow it down? Do, do it all and yeah, then find out. Absolutely, mm. I've I totally done everything. Agree. I keep mm. telling people I, I used to weld. I welded <laughs> once. It's just my favorite thing. Um, I'm going to go back to welding. Um, yeah, I've been a poet, I've been a writer, I've been a director, I've been a sound designer, I've been a lighting designer. I've welded one time. Um, I've been a stage manager, I've been a deputy stage manager, and I've been a company manager. Um, and then I've been a producer, I've been a general manager. Um, and I just found the thing I liked the most. I would highly recommend doing all of, doing all of the things <laughs> and then figuring it out. Um, if you don't try it, you'll never know. So that's, that's probably my, my advice. Paulie, I was wondering whether actually being a lighting director and an electrician goes hand in hand, like they're really good skills. Um, I mean, yeah, that was just a case of survival. <laughs> it's like you've got, you've got to earn a living somehow. And, you know, I could earn a living rigging lights while I was dreaming about, you know, designing lights. So, but I do agree that I also, you know, when I first started in the industry, I toured as a technical stage manager. I toured as a wardrobe person. I worked as a rigger, I worked as in rock and roll, I've been a production manager, I've been a DSM, I've, in, I've worked in a producer's office. I just think, it, I think a lot of our education system at the moment makes you feel that you have to know. And I think that's really dangerous because actually how one participates in making any work is a really massive unknown and, you, and, and always surprising kind of the bits of you that are of interest. And I also, I spent a lot of time working with devising companies. And in the end, my response was with light. But on that journey into that, I'd spend days improvising, making props, doing whatever it took to make work. So I think the kind of division of things isn't very useful, really. Mm. I think the point is, is that we're all trying to make stuff and finding the bit that, also, how, uh, as you say, how do you know till you do it? Yeah you know, which bit of it really excites you and the kind of collective nature of it, I think is break down those barriers and cross over those sort of ideas. I love the idea of finance and, and costume, the kind of being interwoven. Because the skills that you need to make to do all of this work, even when you're on a, you know, I think sometimes working on the main stage here, the thing that prepared me most for doing that work is doing a lot of pub theater because you have to work so quickly and there's no margin for error. And you, but it's just on a much bigger scale. But ultimately, that's the, that's the muscle I'm using. So it's always surprising. Mm. Really great. Mm. Angela. Uh, yeah, I'll just say it's all useful. So always try what you can and take those opportunities because they will feed you and they will come through even if they don't become your main strand. They will inform that. So yeah, I'll just see to everything you guys said. Yeah. Well, I think resilience came through really strongly. Um, I think flexibility 
And I think there was a huge sense from both the questions, but also from the panel um, to really believe in yourself and, and take that leap and, and think about what feeds you. So thank you. I've got some thank yous that I have to read out, so forgive me. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, White Light and John Good, to our uh, volunteers and partners, the Royal Opera House, which has given us this incredible space, Masterclass, Mousetrap, Theatre Projects, and apparently I also have to thank my own organisation, so that's <laughs> slightly <laughs> awkward. And thank you, panel, and thank you for coming. So really appreciate it.